In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask you pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Today, we interrupt the normal sequence of what they call the catechetical outline of a retreat because of the feast day, the memorial in many places that we are celebrating, which is the chair of St. Peter. And so let us pause to ponder once more this wonderful reality that we have in the Catholic Church of the see of Peter, the chair of Peter, the office of the Pope. Why the office of the Pope? Why Peter? And to answer this question, let us allow the liturgy, which has chosen a passage from the Gospel of St. Matthew, something that we should all memorize. Not because we make an effort to memorize it, but because of our frequent use of it, our frequent meditation of it. <clears throat> I'm referring to that passage in chapter 16, verses 16 and thereabouts. Of that event that happened in what is known as Caesarea Philippi. There were several, shall we say, cities which were called Caesarea during the time of the Romans, even in Palestine. You can imagine why. Everybody was outdoing each other. I mean, the, the governors and the, uh, the leaders, the kings, to put up something in honor of Caesar, buttering, buttering up to Caesar, I suppose. In Palestine, for example, during that time, there were at least two Caesareas. Caesarea Maritima, which was put up by Herod, Herod the Great, the builder. It was a maritime city. And then there was Caesarea Philippi in the northwest extreme of Palestine, already beyond the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Genazareth, the Lake of Genazareth, almost Syria already. Even up to now, it's a popular place. It's like a resort because it has many lush foliage, springs, little falls. I think the biggest fall that they have can imagine falls in Palestine, right? With, with the aridity there, so. Uh, falls are not like, don't imagine the kind of falls we have here, because here in the Philippines, we have a tropical rainforest, we have plenty of rainfall. There, their falls are very small, but the biggest one that they have, I think, is in Caesarea Philippi. And so our Lord, in this particular episode <clears throat> from Capernaum, in the northwest, uh, or in the western side of the Sea of Galilee, had taken his apostles going northwards to this place, to this resort, in order to form them more intensely. Maybe a weekend or a few days of quiet from the crowd. Because as we also read in the gospel, <clears throat> there was so much coming and going that there was no time even to eat. And our Lord had to form his disciples. Again, you know, we have to... Uh, be very sensitive to what is known as, in Spanish, we call it composición de lugar, the context, the contextualization of the gospel passages. Remember that our Lord had barely two years to form the apostles, from erstwhile rude, ignorant fishermen to become the pillars of the Catholic Church that would spread the gospel all over the world. Even nowadays, college is more than two years. It used to be, there was supposed to, uh, before there was a two year liberal arts course, but nowadays college is normally four years. So two years was a very short time to form them. And that's the reason why they were together all the time. 
It was an itinerant school, just like the peripathetics of Athens before around Aristotle. They were coming and going, but all the time being formed. Our Lord was always talking to them, teaching them in multis argumentis we read there in many, many, not many arguments, but many ways. Well, okay, it was one of those times. And we read St. Matthew. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Like one of the famous, the, the major prophets of old had resurrected. Hmm? And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? My brothers and sisters, our Lord always seeks intimacy, seeks a dialogue, a personal relationship. Not what the people say, not what uh, the commentators say, not what some preacher said, although those can be inputs to our own interior life, to our own conversation with our Lord. Even this meditation that you're attending right now, you're listening to right now, if you notice our background is a tabernacle. Because normally, if this were, if you we were in normal times, meditations like this are not given online. They're given in a chapel, in an oratory. And in an oratory, the setting is exactly what you see here. A little bit dimmed with two candles because the big candles are just for feasts and for uh, liturgical celebrations. With the priest in a little table, on one side to one side of the altar, the way I am right now. Why? Because the conversation of the congregation should be with God, with Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. You're not supposed to be entertained by the priest or be dazzled by his erudition or rhetoric. Whatever he's saying is just giving you some bullet points for consideration, some outline, which you have to repackage on your own in order to deal with Jesus Christ on your own. And this is what happened then. They were telling our Lord the impression, the convictions, of other people, but then he seeks a personal response. How about you? Who do you say that I am? Let's get out of the anonymity of the crowd. It's so easy to say we. How about I? How about me? I remember years ago in a seminary, the preacher was talking about generosity, about the vocation to the priesthood about the needs of the apostolate, of how the seed of the gospel and the spirit of opus, they had to be carried to all <clears throat> corners of the world. And then he said, and who's going to carry it? Who's going to do it? Don't think some other people were volunteer. Of course, he was alluding to us, right? Who were there in that congregation, in that particular group, in that particular chapel brothers and sisters, when you pray in the privacy of your chapel or in your room, be sure you reach this I-Thou relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if not, if you don't feel alluded to, then everything escapes. Then there will be no commitment. And what will happen to the prayer is what happens in a cocktail what I call a cocktail conversation. You know very well what happens in a cocktail. A cocktail is a very specific social form. It's not a sit-down dinner. In a cocktail, you're working the cocktail, so to speak. You don't even sit down. You're standing up, moving here and there, picking up canapes or hors d'oeuvres from the, from the waiter, sipping your, your drink, meeting many people. Everything is pleasantries. But there's no commitment there. 
you need commitment, you need to sit down. Perhaps you even need to sign a contract or shake on it at least. Well, that's what we need to do in our prayer too. And our Lord demanded that from the apostles. Who, who do you think I am? And it was Peter, immediately Peter. You, know, you have to love Peter. Peter was wearing his heart on his sleeve all the time. Quick to the draw. He was led by his heart many times. And so Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, saying, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, which in Aramaic means Simon, son of John, because that's the name of his father, Jonah, John. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Actually, our Lord proclaimed several fundamental truths in those verses. First of all, of course, is Peter's primacy. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. You know that the fundamentalists, many Protestants, have engaged in a lot of, shall we say, mind-bending, and uh, shall we say, hair-splitting regarding this Peter. Hmm? Who is Petrus? You are Peter. And upon this rock, then they, they change that Petrus and Petra, according to them. And superat Petram edificavo ecclesia meum. That's the Latin. At least if they were speaking in Latin, then I mean to say the those Protestant or fundamentalist exegetes, it would, I don't know, have a little bit more of weight. But it's even worse if you try to argue that point on the basis of English, which is just a translation. Because even Latin is a translation. You know, our Lord did not speak Latin. Pontius Pilate spoke Latin. That's why when you watch the Passion of the Christ, Pilate was speaking in Latin. But our Lord was speaking in Aramaic because that was the language of the Jews at that time. Not even Hebrew. Hebrew is high-class Hebrew. But the language of the street, something like Pidgin Hebrew, if you want to, if uh, you, you may. It's the kind of Hebrew that had is spread in Palestine and even among many of the Semitic tribes around Palestine. It was called Aramaic. Our Lord spoke Aramaic. And in Aramaic, the name that he gave Peter was Kephas. And Kephas means rock. So there's no doubting about it. When he said, you are Peter, what he was saying, you are Kephas, what he was saying was, you are rock. And upon this rock, there was no change of subject. I will build my church. Peter was the rock, no doubt about it, that he was going to build his church on. Peter is not just one among many. He's a very specific choice. So too is this, that even among the apostles, they looked up to Peter. And as soon as our Lord had, had, had uh, been crucified, had died, in other words, they congregated around Peter. Later on, um, I hope during, as we approach Holy Week, we shall be meditating on those Halcyon days after Easter when the disciples would go to Galilee because our Lord told them, the resurrected Christ told them to go there, wait for him there because they would see, see them there. And there was that famous day when Peter said, I'm going fishing. Of course, he's a fisherman and he had to eat. So what would he do? He, he went, he was going fishing. And immediately the other disciples were going with you. 
And later on, when the, the gospel was spreading and St. Paul had already become a staunch apostle rather than a, persecu um, a persecutor of the, of the faith. And when there was that famous, shall we say, question regarding the Jews or rather the Gentiles that had been uh, converted to Christianity, whether or not they could eat meat that had been uh, offered to the idols because those kinds of meat offerings were later on sold in the market and they were sold at the bargain. So there was nothing wrong with that. But you know, the Jews who had been converted to Christianity because of course, initially uh, the Christians were coming from Judaism. Jews converted, well, okay, they were complaining because they were scandalized. Those were unclean, et cetera, et cetera. And then there was the question of circumcision that they wanted the Gentiles that had been converted to be circumcised too, like they were. And of course, growing up men didn't want to do that. And so there was that question, and what happened? How did they resolve that? Paul went to Jerusalem, Videre Petrum, to see Peter. So Peter is unique. Why? Because God chose him. Jesus Christ chose him. Why? To build this church. This is the second great truth that is revealed in this passage. On this rock, I will build my church. You see, the church was not constituted by men raising their hands like the constitutional fathers. The church is an assembly of people assembled by God. Nowadays, it's through the reception of baptism. Even then, it was through that. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in his doctrine. In other words, a personal assent to the revelation an act of faith passing through a ritual, a sacrament, which was baptism, that constituted the church, which was not just an assembly, shall we say, of people, but it was an assembly, but vitalized, uh, um, informed by the Holy Spirit, which was going to happen on Pentecost Sunday, but we're jumping forward in our retreat. We're crossing the desert already, arriving at the destination. We're not yet there. So let's concentrate on this point. One, Christ chose Peter in order to build his church. Why? And the answer is so commonsensical that sometimes it's mind-boggling why some people don't get it. Because Christ was going to die. Sure, he was going to resurrect, but he was going to heaven. And so what? He's going to leave behind his disciples, giving behind the church that he had founded without a visible leader, without someone who can call the shots and have the final say. And then what we have is continuous arguments, continuous discussions. Can you imagine even now when you already have a pope there are still people who come up with dissenting ideas. What more if there's no Pope? Then perhaps every bishop will have his own idea. And what we'll have is an atomization, a compartmentalization, a fragmentation of the church, which is what happens precisely in those Orthodox Christian communities that do not, um, are not united with the Pope. I'm referring to the Orthodox churches. What has happened in those churches? Precisely churches, plural. You have the Greek Orthodox, you have the Russian Orthodox, you have the Serbian Orthodox, you have the Croatian Orthodox, along nationalistic lines. Are they Orthodox? Yes. Are they real Christians? Yes. Are their sacraments valid? Definitely. But they're atomized. Have you ever heard of and you know what? Philippine Catholic Church. What you have is a Catholic Church in the Philippines. Or a U.S. Catholic Church. Or a French Catholic Church. If, if ever you come across that term, you have to correct it because it's wrong. It's theologically imprecise. 
and it may lead to very serious errors precisely because of what we're talking about here. There's only one Catholic church. Catholic precisely is Greek. It means universal. The Catholic church is universal and ex it exists in different places, but it's the same it. It's not fragmented. Why? Because of Peter. That's why in, in the doctrine of the Second Vatican Council, which is a continuation of the doctrine of the First Vatican Council, now, the First Vatican Council, the one there in the 19th century, hmm, that was interrupted by the entry of the forces of Cavour in the, um, what they call this, the nationalist uh, revolution in Italy, had two uh, items in their agenda. One, to define the authority of the Pope, not just the authority, but the office, the whole office of the Pope and his authority. And number two, to study the nature of the church. They finished the first one with that landmark document um, de defining the, the office of Peter and the papal infallibility. Unfortunately, they didn't get to the second topic because precisely it was interrupted. And that topic was taken up in the Second Vatican Council almost a century after. And what a wonderful job the Second Vatican Council uh, did on that topic with the, the famous document Lumen Gentium. And also, to a certain extent, um, in, what do you call this? Um, yeah, okay, Lumen Gentium is basically it. But let's continue our meditation because in this passage, our Lord promised that that church will not be taken down. The forces of evil shall not prevail against it. You know, we're living in times which are very troubled. Every now and then there are threats to Catholic orthodoxy, even threats to morality. Nowadays, for example, I don't know if you're aware that there are moves to file, a, not just a divorce bill because that's being filed with every Congress in the Philippines, but there's now a, somebody wants to file a bill legalizing abortion because of, especially with the the new uh, dispensation that they have in the United States, a lot of funding will come again, will flow towards this drive for birth control and this in support of contraception and also of abortion. Well, when, when things like this happen, sometimes you may be tempted to fall into despair. What is this world going to? What will happen to us? Or perhaps you hear of the scandals every now and then of even the people of the hierarchy, ecclesiastics misbehaving, getting involved in cases, crimes. Remember that in the time of our Lord, already there was a Judas of the 12 apostles, one was a traitor. That's 8%. Nowadays, you know, when, when you hear of cases of um, uh, clergy misbehaving, it doesn't even reach 1% of the clergy, less than that. Well, in the case of the apostles, 8%, because that's Judas, misbehaved. Why? Because human freedom is like that. Nobody is exempt when it comes to moral behavior. But mind you, when it comes to doctrine, when it come to, comes to teaching the whole flock of the community of the faithful regarding faith and morals, the Pope cannot possibly err. Christ made it that way. He may err personally. He may live less than a saintly life. And there have been um, cases like that in the history of the church. But when it comes to faith and morals, there's that gift of infallibility. 
And that was revealed in this passage also. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Whatever doctrine you bind, whatever you pronounce in matters of faith and morals, speaking to the whole church in a definitive way, you have the gift, the help of the Holy Spirit that you will not err. Well, we're reaching the end of this meditation. Normally I give you some time to finish it. Now we have very little time. You'll have three minutes on your own to formulate your resolutions. And I would like to suggest in the following direction. Number one, to pray more for the Pope. No matter who he is, he's the vicar of Christ. He stands in the shoes of the fisherman of Peter. Pray for him, offer penance for him, support him. Never, shall we say, contradict his teachings. Don't be part of the problem because sometimes they say, no, uh, what he said can be misinterpreted. Well, well, so don't, mis so don't mis misinterpret it. Rather, spread it the way it should be interpreted, not misinterpreted. Second, not to ever lose hope. Definitely not to talk badly of the church or to talk badly of the hierarchy, but not to lose hope in its integrity because our Lord said, promised in Caesarea Philippi, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And our Blessed Mother and Saint Joseph will be there making sure that this family that their son had organized, had instituted, shall prevail up to the end of time. 